Some folks were a little surprised to find out that Nelson Peltz was selling Disney, or at least some of the shares that Tryan owned before the end of 2023. But what does it really mean? Let's break it down. Well, folks, welcome back. Another great day here at Valiant Renegade. It's good to see everybody out there once again. And if you are like one of the many folks watching this video, not yet subscribed to this channel, please take a moment and turn that little red subscribe button to gray. Hit that like button. Hit that notification bell. Share this sucker out on the social medias. And of course, please do leave a comment before you head out the door today. Make sure to join us every Sunday afternoon at 6 p.m. Eastern right here for the live show. It all started yesterday with this article from Puck, which got a lot of attention and some questions about what is going on. And while the headline was about Buffett buried deeper in the story, we find some information about Nelson Peltz, Tryan, and the Walt Disney Company. This from William Cohen over in the kingdom. Speaking of selling, Nelson Peltz sold some 7.3% of his fund's stake in Disney during the fourth quarter, Tryon now owns 6.77 million Disney shares worth $755 million these days. This is as of February 18th, down from 7.3 million shares at the end of the third quarter of 2023. He also continues to have voting control over Ike Perlmutter's 25.5 million Disney shares. Why would Nelson Peltz sell down his stake in Disney? in the middle of a high-profile proxy fight with the company when he's trying to get board seats for himself and former Disney CFO Jay Rasulo beats me, but it's not a good look, that's for sure. Now, understandably, right off the bat, that's going to give some people cause for concern that may not otherwise understand some of the routine machinations that come with investing. But to Mr. Cohen and Puck's credit, they do go into some of those possibilities. The obvious explanation is profit-taking. Since the beginning of the year, which we presume he means 2024, the Disney stock is up 23% and nearly 30% in the last six months which more or less encompasses the time period of Peltz's second intifada against Disney. Why not take some profit on a portion of your stake in Disney and hope that nobody notices? But let's look back here. On September 29th, the final day of the third calendar quarter, Walt Disney Company stock was at $81 a share. And on December 29th, the final trading day of 2023, Disney was at $90.29 per share. So it picked up about 10 bucks a share during that fourth and final quarter of the calendar year. But it was sometime during that calendar quarter that those shares were sold. And where do we get that information? If we look, as of September 30th, Tryan owned 32.868 million shares of the Walt Disney Company or owned and had beneficial management, including Ike Perlmutter shares of that amount. But on December 30th, they had shed somewhere to the tune of about half a million shares or a little over, going down to 32.337 million shares. So what Mr. Cohen and Puck are saying here is essentially correct. However, there would have been no enjoyment in the growth of those 500,000 or so shares they sold after the first of the year since they were already gone. But yes, indeed, profit-taking or Sometimes tax loss or gain harvesting is a very common feature when it comes to investing. A lot of times as you get towards the end of the year, you look at the holdings and you look where you can maybe offset some gains and losses. There are also other possibilities that perhaps one of the investors in the fund decided to liquidate a portion of their holdings and the holdings themselves, that is the stock or whatever investments there are inside of the fund itself, would have to be in effect, liquidated in order to make that possible. To be clear, that's just all theory and speculation, giving you an idea of what the possibilities were at the moment that this was done, as opposed to just simply assuming that Nelson Peltz sold some shares of Disney because he didn't have any faith in it or his own proxy campaign anymore. I think the most important thing to understand is that it really doesn't matter how many shares that Tryon, Nelson Peltz, or Ike Perlmutter, or anybody else for that matter, held on December 30th. The only thing that mattered is how many shares did they hold as of the recording date for the annual shareholder meeting that's coming up in April. And that recording date was in early February, just before the earnings call on Wednesday, February 7th. 
In other words, let's say for a moment that Tryon, or anybody else for that matter, like maybe Elon Musk. So what brings you to the Lola carpet? I'm just, uh, just here with friends, you know, thinking about companies to acquire. Decided that they wanted to get involved and have voting power at the annual shareholder meeting to vote for either Bob Iger's Disney board or the proxy boards put up by somebody like Nelson Peltz. As long as they purchased shares before the close of the market on the recording date, which was Monday, February 5th, then they would have been eligible to vote in that annual shareholder meeting. As a wild hypothetical example, somebody could have bought a billion dollars worth of Disney stock before the recording date and then immediately turned around and sold it a day or two later they'd still have the ability to vote as long as they were a stockholder at that moment when that recording happened. So whatever Nelson Peltz, Ike Perlmutter, or Tryon itself did before that point in time, in the long run, it's a bit of a non sequitur. It really doesn't matter. And for all we know, Nelson Peltz and Tryon could have picked up those 500,000 shares right back after the first of the year. We just wouldn't know about it yet. Even the article says Peltz certainly didn't mention selling down during his recent interview with CNBC's Sarah Eisen this past week. In fact, if you listen to Nelson Peltz during that interview, you'd think he'd be a buyer of more Disney stock, not a seller. Well, maybe there was nothing really to report. Maybe he has bought more shares and the reporting just hasn't dropped yet. We don't know. But again, the only thing that matters is how many shares he had on that recording date. If Peltz really thought he was going to win and be able to implement his proposed strategic changes, he'd be betting on the stock to go up, not down. Otherwise, why bother? I assume he'll be selling more this quarter, too. But just like Buffett at Paramount, he made a profit of around $150 million during his first proxy fight with Disney a year ago before abandoning it before the actual shareholder vote in April. He now owns 25% less stock in Disney than he did a year ago, of course, not including Ike Perlmutter. And he's already taking profits as his holdings continue to whittle down. Sometimes it's important to watch what these guys do, not what they say on CNBC. One of the other things that I would caution about Peltz is that he's not a stupid guy. He has a very, very storied track record of getting engaged with other publicly traded companies, buying the stock, getting on the board, and doing exactly what he says he's going to do. I don't think he's just trying to finagle the Disney stock price to make a quick buck. At the end of the day, Nelson Peltz has to act as a fiduciary and do his job, not just what he personally wants to do. Cohen also thinks that, well, in fact, Peltz has lost. If he really thought he was going to win and be able to implement his proposed strategic changes at Disney, he'd be betting on the stock to go up, not down. I'd get a little cautious with this, and especially in comparison to last year. Remember, Nelson Peltz walked away from the first proxy fight in early 2023 after Disney and CEO Bob Iger committed to the fact that they would find a successor on time for Bob Iger. And number two, they would also capitulate to some of the requests that Tryon had made for more fiscal discipline, for bigger cuts, and yes, to restore a dividend to Disney stockholders. Think about Ike Perlmutter for a second with 25 plus million shares. When Disney was paying a dividend back before the lockdowns in 2020, that dividend to Ike Perlmutter every year would have been probably around $50 million. But after Bob Iger and Disney told Peltz that they would work towards some of his goals last year, Peltz walked away feeling like we got to win here. But then, of course, reality set in over the next several months. The Disney stock performance went back down again. Bob Iger was renewed for another two years, meaning the succession planning had yet again failed. And, well, here we are back to square one with Peltz making the second push. I find it unlikely, especially at this point, now that we're this deep in the weeds, Peltz isn't going anywhere. These proxy cards are going out. And if Disney was so complacent with where they are, or if Disney was so confident in what their chances were for getting their own board reinstalled, then why was Disney making videos like this, begging stockholders to vote for their slate? The major distractions we're facing from activist investors are exactly what we don't need. I'm urging you to vote for the Disney board's recommended slate of nominees on the white proxy card. It seems to me if you felt like you had this thing in the bag, you just might not draw attention to Nelson Peltz. You might just leave it be, but 
Disney felt like they needed to make a push with stockholders to make sure that they voted on the proper voting card, or at least in so far as Bob Iger is concerned. Finally, Puck Magazine says, My bet is he gets out while the getting is good, just like his friend Warren Buffett with Paramount. You don't get as rich as these guys do without knowing when to cut and run. Very true. However, he could get out of it right now, and it wouldn't matter. He still gets to vote those shares for the annual stockholder meeting. He could have gotten out of it right after the earnings call. It wouldn't matter. He still gets to vote those shares. We still have six or seven weeks to go on this one, folks. So sit tight. Don't worry about the big headlines. And if some new ones do come across, we will, of course, as always, discuss them right here. Until next time, take care. Make sure you're subscribed to Valiant Renegade and join us every Sunday at 6 p.m. Eastern for the live show.